Uh, my name is John Smart, and I'm a futurist. Two years ago, in 2010, I came across one of the most interesting topics I'd seen in the future space uh, in the last 10 years. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. It's called Chemical Brain Preservation. So, the title of the talk, Chemical Brain Preservation, How to Live Forever. Note we have forever in quotes. Right? I'm not an immortalist. I'm a person who believes in extended lifespan. And there's a difference, and we'll talk about that. And this is a personal view. So, my perspective isn't necessarily shared by my colleagues at the Brain Preservation Foundation, but I think there's a lot of overlap. So the subtitle is why the option to inexpensively preserve our brains when we die is good for ourselves and society and how you can help. Here's four books on extended lifespan, commonly called immortality, that I recommend. The Immortalist from the late 70s, probably the first statement saying that it's time for us to kind of get beyond an orientation to death in our society because there's technologies coming that will allow us to do that. Unfortunately, he didn't know what those technologies were. The first book that really suggested a credible path to getting beyond death was this book here, Mind Children, by the roboticist Hans Moravec. What he basically said was machines are figuring out all of our higher order patterns. There's going to be something like a singularity human surpassing machine intelligence. One way or another, we're going into this space. We might come back out into the biology if we want, but the most interesting thing he said is that we probably wouldn't come back into the biology very often. And the reason why is the critical things that we care about in our biology, our consciousness, our thinking, our perception, they happen millions of times slower in wetware than they do in the digital space. So if you were to create an artificial neural network, it would be very simple, but it would think at the speed of electricity. And you and I think at, how fast do we think? About 100 miles an hour. That's how fast the action potentials move in our heads. And that's about 7 million times slower than machines work today. Another really good book on immortality that you should read is The Quest for Immortality. It came out about 10 years ago. And what Olshansky and Karn said is, don't expect biological life extension to give you more than another 20 years or so. And the reason why is you and I are built out of this kind of like a tissue paper. And we fall apart six, seven, eight different ways from the inside out at an accelerating rate after sexual maturity. We can slow that down a little bit, but we can't stop it. So all of the life extension friends that you may have in the bio, and talk about all these biological things you could do. Olshansky says the best you're going to get is something that might move you from dying at 90 to dying at 120 or 110, 115. So that's just doing what's called squaring the curve, moving more of us up to where the maximum of us currently dies. Okay? And then a book that's in the bookstore here that I recommended is called uh, Immortality by Stephen Cave, and the subtitle is The Quest to Live Forever and How It Drives Civilization. And what he basically said is our immortality drive is a social good, and he gives reasons why. This desire to live more, to live longer, to live higher quality life pretty much is behind uh, all the major positive social innovations that he sees. I think it's a, it's a very interesting book, and I recommend it. Now, when Isaac Asimov, one of my favorite, one of my heroes, was asked uh, uh, whether he would like to live forever, whether he'd like to be cryonically suspended, what is cryonics? Chilling, yeah, freezing, yeah. He said, well, why would I want that? I've written 500 books. <laughs> now, I respect that. That's a fascinating perspective. When you really think about it, all of the things he really cared about, he'd already uploaded them, hadn't he? Unfortunately, have you and I written 500 books? It's a pretty rare person that can write 500 books, get all their best ideas out. So when you and I die, there's typically things that are in us that we haven't been able to immortalize, if you will. If you think about extended lifespan, there's five types that I'd like you to consider. There's works, the things you do for your children, the behaviors, the ideas you pass on. You immortalize yourself through that. 
There's records if you're like Asimov or if you're an artist and you do paintings and you can immortalize yourself or have an extended lifespan. Let's be more accurate. Beyond your biological life with a work that might have great value to your children, to society at large. If you're Shakespeare, it might live for generations or something that your, your children care about. There's three others, though, that have really opened up to us now. You can leave behind a simulation of yourself. We're going to get to that in a minute. We're going to talk about how that might change your perspective on extended lifespan. You can give your memories to the future. We're going to talk about that. That's a weird idea. How can I give things that I've experienced? Or you can go to the future, if you'd like. Your identity can go. How can you do this? Through a process called chemopreservation, chemical brain preservation, or plastination. How many people have heard of body worlds? Anatomists grossly preserve whole human bodies using this plastination technique. Electron microscopists have perfectly preserved neurons for 50 years using a high-end version of this technique. And they know the neurons are perfectly preserved because they look at them under what? A very high-power microscope called an electron microscope. So the interesting question is, can we do that not for small um, pieces of neural tissue, which has been done for 50 years, can we do it for a whole brain? And if we do it for a whole brain, is that us? A fantastic new book that's asking that question just came out by Sebastian Sung, one of the advisors of the Brain Preservation Foundation. His subtitle is How the Brain's Wiring Makes Us Who We Are. He is a neuroscientist who fully at MIT who fully believes that the connectome is us. And WiredDifferently.org is his website that is formed to test that hypothesis. So the connectome is the set of connections that all the neurons make in the brain. Here are some scanned, uh, some electron, uh, some neurons who have been, that have been preserved using that plastination technique that I mentioned and scanned into the electron microscope. Brain Preservation Foundation is the nonprofit that I started with my co-founder Ken Hayworth in 2010. And our mission is to put the science of brain preservation under the electron microscope to investigate it. And if it works, to advocate globally for brain preservation, affordability, and access. Now here's a brain slicing machine that Ken invented maybe four years ago. And here is a special kind of a microscope that is used to look at those slices and reconstruct the neurons. We have a number of advisors, very distinguished individuals, and I would call them careful endorsers. They want to know whether this technology really does capture us. So they're not complete converts. Some of them are constructive skeptics. Most of them think there's a high probability, though, that this, techno this technology, this project, may work. How may it work? Well, we'll talk about it in a minute. Okay? And we have a number of other advisory boards as well. So disclaimer, we don't preserve people at the Brain Preservation Foundation. We don't advocate a particular preservation procedure or company. We assess technical efficacy, the effectiveness, and affordability. And if good efficacy can be demonstrated, we seek to improve global accessibility and patients' rights. So we got anonymous person to put up a $100,000 prize purse. It's kind of similar to the X Prize, if you've heard of that. 25% of that prize goes to the first team that can preserve a mouse brain in a way that captures the whole connectome and 75 to the first team that can preserve a whole pig brain using a protocol that could be used on humans. Now, how is this concept, plastination, different from cryonics, which has been around since the 60s? There's one of the pioneers, Robert Ettinger, who was frozen last year. I think he was the 200th patient in the world. So not many people get frozen. Now, we think the reasons a lot of people don't get frozen have to do with this. How expensive is it? How simple is it? How dependable? How validated? And have my friends done it? A big problem with cryonics, from my personal perspective, is it's way too expensive. You're taking a minimum of $90,000 away from your children for a very uncertain future return. Plastination, however, 
has a promise to be a lot less expensive. We're estimating it could start at 20000 and get down to below $5,000 with just a few people getting involved in it. And it's a lot simpler. Once you've plastinated that brain, what do you do with it? You don't have to keep it frozen. How does it work? The first thing that happens is in a hospital, hospice, or home where the person is dying, right after they die, you put in this small chemical called glutaraldehyde, you put it into the circulatory system, like blood, it goes to every cell in the body, and it locks down your entire protein cytoskeleton. Is that crazy or what? That's what glutaraldehyde does. All these little chemicals cross-link with each other, and they stop any further changes happening in the proteins. So the cells can't eat themselves. They can't degrade. They still can in the things that aren't proteins. As you know, you have other you have fats and sugars and things like that. And they don't, those don't get locked down as nicely as the proteins do. But you lock down all the proteins. Does the protein cage carry all of your memories? Is it the thing that is most central to you? Well, that's a question that has to be tested, doesn't it? And the people that I talk to say, yes, it does. Then the next thing that would happen is you would take that chemo-preserved body, you would take it to a centralized facility, and this is not time-sensitive. You take out the brain of the person, put it in the bath, cremate or bury the rest of the person. And then in that bath, you do these series of steps and turn it into this little piece of plastic right here. The water gets leached out, and the plastic goes in, and now you have this kind of paperweight. That's you. All the proteins are still there. All the neural connections are still there. And most importantly, all the weightings of the neural connections, the specific things that determine the strength of those connections, and the 3D structure, it's all there. How do you know it's there? Well, you take it, you slice it nanometer thin, and you put it in an electron microscope, and you reconstruct the 3D structure. Can we do that for a whole brain yet? No way. Way too expensive, way too much processing power. Will we be able to do that for a whole brain in 20, 30, 40 years? Well, that's what Moore's Law and all these exponential trends tell us, right? Another important thing to remember is this has to happen, this first step has to happen very soon after the person dies. And that's where most of the cost of this procedure is. This emergency glutaraldehyde procedure has got to happen right next to the hospital, hospice, or home where the person dies. And here is a brain that has been, the circulatory system has been preserved using that plastination technique, and the rest of it has been eaten away with a strong base. Okay? So your brain loves blood, doesn't it? You have blood supply that goes uh, within just a few cells of every cell in your brain. That glutaraldehyde that you put into the circulatory system is also just a few cells away from every cell in your brain. That's why your brain gets locked down so well by it when you put it into a brain. Does that make sense? Now, the cool thing is there's several techniques people have figured out for preventing these problems after 15 minutes. There are certain chemicals you can put in that cause your cells to hibernate, so you have more than 15 minutes. Your cells go into a, a low oxygen mode. There's chemicals you can put in that, that stop your body from coagulating after a person dies. And that gives you more than 15 minutes before you have the circulatory collapse. So there's all these really cool technologies, but there's very few people trying to investigate them because there aren't a lot of people that need this right now. An interesting question is, is chemical fixation alone, without that plastination step that I mentioned, enough for preserving a brain? We don't know. This question hasn't been answered. Fortunately, it probably will over the next um, decade because we have brains from the 1800s, as Sagan said, is the anatomist Paul Broca, whose brain is in a jar of just formaldehyde. This isn't even the stronger glutaraldehyde. This is a weaker form called formaldehyde. Is Paul Broca still there? Is Einstein, whose brain we have, again, in formaldehyde, a weaker form, is Einstein still there? We don't know. Now, the, most of their protein structure has been preserved by formaldehyde, but also changes have happened. Some of those proteins have broken down at room temperature storage. So is a computer, a smart enough computer, going to be able to look at that and fix it and 
pull back out uh, the signal? How redundant is the signal in our brain? Well, it's associative. So if you forget something, you can't remember a person's name, what do you do? You noodle around for a moment and you think of some other aspect of the person and what ends up happening? You reestablish a weak link and now that person's memory comes out. That's the power of an associative brain. It's very resilient to damage. How resilient? Could you take a brain that's partly erased a little bit, or weakened with these imperfect preservations and actually pull those memories out? We don't know. Where will these brains be stored? We're thinking cemeteries, contracts, storage, and private homes. Now, cemetery is a particularly interesting place. How many people know what life gem is? 40% of cemeteries have this feature. <laughs> if you die, yeah, your loved ones can take your cremated remains and make a diamond out of the carbon in your ash. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so our thinking is taking a plastinated brain and putting it in the ground. That's just another feature that probably a lot of cemeteries might be willing to do. Okay. It's the least behavior change for people, so it probably makes sense to be the most probable solution. See what I'm saying? And that's kind of an interesting picture if you think about it. You know, my grandmother's in the ground, and is she going to stay in the ground? Well, maybe not. I don't know. So that starts to change our perspective a little bit on uh, not only what a cemetery is, but on human life, which we're going to get to in a moment. Some of the most exciting things to me about this. So what's our vision? So a reliable procedure is proven. That's what our prize is about. And it's demonstrated to preserve associative memory in model organisms, which we're going to talk about next. When that first happens, that's going to be big. Because people are going to look and say, oh, not only is does the, does, does the connectome perfectly, does it look good on an electron microscope, but if I t- train a model organism and I scan its brain, I can tell you how it was trained by reading the scan. As soon as that happens, and we think that could easily happen within the next 10 years, that's going to cause a big shift in people's perspective on who they are. Then we get 500 neuroscientists to sign a statement saying there's probably some information in a human brain if you do this same thing to a human. We don't know how much, but there's some. There's probably memories you're going to get out of that in the future. And then once we have that, we start pushing people to... uh, offer this. Okay? So how it's done, you take the brain, you get a piece, cut it thin, image it, reconstruct using this reconstruction software, and then you have these visualizable connectomes. And there's easily 30, 40 labs now that do this around the world. This is becoming a a major area of of neuroscience. Connectomics research. Here's an example from a little worm called C. elegans. And the resolution of the tools we're using today is 5 nanometers. Now, that basically, as you can see, shows you a large cellular structure. doesn't give you the actual brain proteins. doesn't go at the level to show you the actual protein. It shows you the, the, the vesicles and things at the tips of the synapses. Um, but it doesn't go all the way down to the proteins. Now, the person, uh, Sean Mikula, is one of our competitors, and he just uh, published this poster. So we have our first mouse brain that has been submitted to be evaluated using these technologies from a competitor group in Heidelberg, Germany. There are technologies, electron microscopy technologies, that do see all the way down to the proteins. And here's an astonishing example of one. So if we need to, and we may not, but if we need to, we'll use technologies like cryotransmission electron microscopy. This here is a picture of a lipoprotein. Lipoproteins are those little fat globules like HDL and LDL in your body taken with a cryotem microscope, an individual fat globule. This isn't a bunch of them averaged together. This is one molecule imaged by bouncing electrons off of it. Now, that doesn't boggle your mind. <laughs> nothing, nothing will. Can we, isn't it amazing we have machines in the early 21st century that can do this? So if, you, if your 
identity, if your memories, the things you care about in here are represented at the molecular level, we're going to be able to see them if, and scan them and pull them out if we need to using these technologies, right? Now, probably the most important mental change people need to make to think about this concept is to become what we call a patternist. You are not your matter. Your matter gets continually recycled based on what you eat. Within a month, a lot of your atoms are out. They've been replaced by new atoms from the food that you've eaten. Every seven years or so, there's kind of a complete wash through, except for certain areas like the, the proteins in the lens of your eye that don't see this turnover. Almost everything where you can get those cataracts, almost everything else gets this constant turnover. So if you're not your matter, what are you? Well, we would argue you're your pattern. And you have these neural correlates. You have consciousness, awareness. You've got emotions, and there's neural correlates for those. You've got thoughts, and there's neural correlates for those. And you've got memories, and there's neural correlates for those. And the stuff that really matters, your identity, is kind of down in the emotion, thought, and memory area. Your consciousness, people think it's so special. It really isn't. Consciousness pops out of anything that has these special patterns at the memory level and the thought level. Okay? Do you have consciousness when, you, when you're when you asleep? No. When you get knocked out? No. So consciousness is like a pattern in a stream. There's a fantastic book on it called Rhythms of the Brain. It's actually neural synchronization in a, in a special wavelength called gamma. Remember alpha, beta, gamma, theta? So gamma sync, according to Busaki, like a bunch of fireflies all synchronizing and flashing together in your brain is what consciousness is, according to him. Now that's going to pop out of any system that has the appropriate pattern. That's the idea. So consciousness is overrated. It's a, it's a froth, it's a pattern that pops out from the dynamic flow of a very special system at the structural level. So what is that level? Well, neurons are a switch and a connection network. They have roots called dendrites, and they've got branches called synapses. And those roots and branches connect up to others with different weightings, and they send an electrical signal if the uh, con connection is strong enough. So the synapse is the weight of the signal, a few special chemicals determine that weight, whether the neuron fires or not. And the connectome is a map of all the neurons and their weights. Okay? And you have three types of memory. You've got working memory, which lasts for just seconds. And that's the electrical signals, as I mentioned, in all your neurons. And that doesn't matter very much at all. You get knocked unconscious, you wake up, and you lose your working memory because <laughs> the signal got disrupted. Do you care? No, I don't care. Working memory, where consciousness resides, the awareness level, also feeds into something called short-term memory. Now that starts to get important. That's the last two days' worth of your experience. That's stored in a special area called the hippocampus, this little C-shaped structure here. And at night, when you're asleep, the short-term memories are written to the cortex during slow-wave phase four sleep. How are they written? Structural changes occur in the way those synaptic neurons, the weightings of those neurons, uh, uh, are constructed. Proteins are synthesized and stitched into the cytoskeleton to create permanent changes. Does that make sense? Isn't that crazy? That's how memory works, three different types. So the one that really matters to us are the molecular changes in the synaptome, the weightings at the ends of all of those synapses. And we've got over 50 neuromodulators and 14 neurotransmitters in our brain, pretty complex. But the memory part looks like it's about six neurotransmitters so far that have been implicated in learning and memory. So a lot of the complexity in our brain is there just to keep those cells working it's a subset of the complexity that stores the stuff we care about, our experiences, our identity.
Make sense? All right. So in 1999, uh, Stanley et al. did a neat trick. They basically patched in with 155 electrodes, patching in to this special area that's a relay center between the visual cortex, which processes what the eye sees, and the eye in the brain of a cat. And then they took those 155 electrodes and they put them through a Fourier transform and they created a map of what the cat was seeing. And here's the researcher looking at the cat. <laughs> Is that crazy? <laughs> I thought it was crazy when that came out in 1999. I go, what? We have decoded the working memory? But we didn't really decode it. We patched in. We jacked in, if you will. Does that make sense? So it's a neat trick, but it's not what we're looking for, is it? We're looking for the ability to read long-term memory. And how's that going to happen? Through a project like this. This is called Open Worm. This is the simplest organism that we completely understand where every cell in its body goes. It's called C. elegans. It's a nematode, like the sliver on the tip of your fingernail, the size of this guy. And Open Worm is an international project trying to do a cell-level simulation of the entire nervous system of this worm. We've mapped all the neurons. We know the number of synapses. This neuron is uh, it's half as complex as us. only got seven neurotransmitters. It doesn't even have action potential. It has electrotonic signals, even simpler. But nobody's modeled the synaptome yet. Why? Because we didn't have the computers. Because we didn't have the people. We weren't ready. We're ready now, okay? Now, here's the exciting thing. These, these are uh, animals that can be trained. You can associate, associatively train these animals because that's, they've got neurons just like us. So when someone can take a simple animal like a, a, a plasia, the sea slug, or a sea elegans, train it, scan it, and then in that special subsystem be able to tell you how that thing was trained, and then you unblind the study and you can say, yep, could have trained it five different ways and this is how it was trained, we will have a proof of concept that the long-term memory code can be read out like a hard drive. Okay? It's going to be a lot more complex than that for human beings. <laughs> There's a whole lot more in there. But are the automation technologies up to it? I would argue they are. Another kind of uploading that's worth thinking about is simulating systems. We are learning to, model by model, create computer simulations of what our brain does. We have chips like IBM Synapse and brain modeling programs like Blue Brain that are trying to do this. Today, they're quite primitive relative to our brains. But there's a lot of people that are very excited about what they can do with these things. And there's some interesting books on this concept as well. And a great website called Carbon Copies, uh, run by one of the BPF advisors. Okay. Now, how far has this computational biology gone? You may have seen that this month we had our first complete life cycle simulation of a living organism was done in a computer. So we've uploaded, if you will, the simplest organism genetically, Mycoplasma genitalium. It takes 10 hours to model the cell cycle in Mycoplasma, and it only takes the real organism half an hour to, to divide. So the wetware is still faster than the hardware. You think that's going to be true in another 10 years? <laughs> no way. So then the simulation space becomes a space where you can explore reality faster then this space, the physical space becomes slow space, simulation space becomes fast space. Is that interesting? So eventually, in the far future, you can predict and understand. Now, I should have put everything in quotes because the whole system is deterministically chaotic at the bottom. You can never understand everything. The best you can do is get these kind of like weather-like predictions for most of the behavior of the system, except for these features that are reliable, like what? Memory like identity, like personality. Because those things 
our body and our, our cares a lot about, and we stitch those things down and we make them as robust as possible. Right. Another proof of concept of this idea is more of Eck's old idea of replacing yourself chip by chip until you basically are a machine and you didn't notice it. And a great example of these, this lovely picture here of this baby with a cochlear implant. There's 60,000 kids that are cyborgs, aren't they? I mean, really advanced cyborgs. They have had a part of their brain replaced by a model that functionally does the same thing. These people are partially uploaded. Now, much more advanced versions of this are coming with retinal chips, which are still investigative. This, these chips are, these photoreceptors are put underneath the retina of an eye. Those things are going to start to take over for natural retinas. A great book on this is Beyond Boundaries, all about human brain machine interfaces and how advanced this technology is becoming. Another strange idea in the uploading space is this question of, uh, well, if I can create a model of me, could I have two me's? And people talk about this as the duplicating problem. Philosophers love to wring their hands about it. It's not a problem, it's a feature. <laughs> okay. Today, biology knows how to create identical twins. In the future, our brains are going to know how to create identical minds. Get over it. Now, why would we want to do that? Because we love subtle variety creating different versions of things. It was Minsky in 88 who said, our brain already does that. We've got a whole bunch of, we're a society of mind. We've got a bunch of little mindsets that are very similar, but they argue with themselves or anything complicated. And occasionally we get these breakdowns of that process called dissociative identity disorder. It used to be called multiple personality disorder. So our brain loves to create subtle variety, and then occasionally we reintegrate them. And Star Trek, of course, got there first, as it always did. Here we have, in 66, we have good Kirk and bad Kirk, the duplication in the transmitter, subtle differences, and they're totally different, you know, personality-wise. Are we going to do that when we have these uploads? Yes. And they're going to argue with themselves, and are they going to reintegrate again later once they solve the problem? These five different carbon copies of me that are out there solving a problem, am I going to pull it back in and take that dissociation and, and reassociate it? Quite possibly so. And a lot of people have written about these ideas in, in science fiction. And that's a very strange idea, but it's just another freedom, isn't it? And that's what life does. Life creates more freedom and more variety, and we should understand it. Now, here's our conversational interface. We are at this age now of talking to our computers. Watson beat the pants off of the two best Jeopardy players in uh, February of uh, last year. We're going to have crude maps of our interests. John, how are they going to have crude maps of our interests? They're stupid. They're just natural language processing systems. They're going to do it because they're going to be teaching us stuff. The wrist PCs, you know, one tablet laptop per child. Google's going to give those out for free because they're making location-based ads on the side, aren't they? They're making money that way. They revolve around openness. All, Coursera has all these free uh, courses, and the machine learning system looks at the people that are learning and tries to build a statistical map of what they're learning already today. These technologies are going to get really good, and they're going to have a statistical map of you. This guy here, Rosetta Stone, $500 to learn English, is going to get knocked off its pedestal. Google or somebody's going to offer a free version that actually rates how good you are, and you're going to go to LinkedIn, and all these kids all around the world, you're going to know their LinkedIn rating on English. It's not just English that's going to be rated by these systems that we're wearing with the conversational interface, it's going to be every skill you're interested in. Context-sensitive delivered to you through your Google Glass or your wearable, you know, wrist PC or whatever. Is that, is that interesting? I think it's really interesting. This means you're going to have a cyber twin. And here's where it gets weird. It gets weird when you die. Are you going to let your kids improve your cyber twin after you die? Google's going to say, sure, I'll keep making the cyber twins smarter by talking to your surviving friends, a better and better statistical map of you, or no, that weirds me out. I'm going to leave it at the level that my mom pruned her up to, kind of like a very good digital scrapbook, but that's enough. 
See how people are going to take different choices, aren't they, with regard to this? The people that are willing to let the thing get smarter are now going to have a third thing besides their works and their records. They're going to have a simulation of them that lives on after their biological life. That's interesting, isn't it? It starts to change our perception of who we are. Would you be willing to leave your memories behind if you believe they could be uploaded another 20, 30 years later cheaply into your cyber twin to make it an even better record of you? You don't need to come back. It's just your memories. Once you have a backup of you, do you care about death? No! You're going to curse if you forgot to back up your last hour of life. Like it happens today if you didn't set your back up to the cloud. Okay? But you're like a person who has great insurance. You don't have fear anymore. Did Star Trek get to this first again? Of course they did. Spectre of the Gun comes out. We have the shootout at the OK Corral, and Spock has to mind meld these guys and say, don't worry, it's just a simulation. You're still here. They can kill your simulation. You gotta back up. And Greg Egan, 20 years later, in Learning to Be Me, jewel heads, these people who have this little indestructible jewel that sits in the base of their skull and basically creates a, a nanotech, uh, nanotech uh, sensor uh, grid in the brain and backs up everything. So the person gets completely obliterated. This indestructible little jewel, they go and they pull the, the um, flight recorder out of the wreckage of the person and back the person up. Right? They reinstantiate the person. Do you think people who have who are jewel heads are less concerned about you know skydiving? I mean, I would be. They're going to live more fearlessly. They're going to in- innovate more. They're going to take more risks. Is that going to make them put them on the leading edge of of creativity and innovation? I would argue it will. Is that what life does? Yes, I would argue that's what life does. What are the motivations? Let's just recap now. One is science. I could do it for basic science. I want to plastinate, give my brains to the future. I could do it for mental variety. One of my favorite motivations is I could do it because I want to have great mental maps of human brains because that's how we can create smart computers that we trust. We know already we can trust people. Can we trust our dogs and cats today? Most of them, right? What about 10,000 years ago? Could you trust a typical dog and cat with a small baby? No. But what did we do? We selected them for symbiosis with us. Can we do exactly the same with our robots? Absolutely, if they're built out of a neural net just like a dog or a cat's brain. Does that make sense, guys? So that's one clear way to trustable AI. That's another reason you might do this. You might do it for memory donations. Like I said, virtual memorials, cultural preservation of unique cultures. Persons dying today in, in, in a special culture, we'll, all, we'll do these ethnographies of them. We're starting to see this concept of a human experience ohm. you imagine being able to go through that and see how people see things from the entire global perspective? My mother has an online memorial she would not have been willing to come back. Her identity, she didn't want extended life. But her memories, would she have given them uh, to the future? She would have done it in a heartbeat if it was what? Affordable. What's affordable? To us, something less than $20,000. Does that make sense? Each person has their own unique perspective on these things. I'm telling you mine, right? My family's. Another motivation you would do it is for self-identity. I'd like to come back. Now, the interesting thing is, if Ray is right and the singularity is near and we're in this hockey stick kind of a world, you're not going to come back in 100 or 200 years when most of your friends are preserved. You're going to come back in less than 50 when the people you care about are still alive, at least all your kids. And that changes some people's perspective on the calculation of whether this makes sense, too, doesn't it? Fourth motivation, my second most favorite motivation, is for the future. I don't know if it's a good thing. But if it gets cheap enough, like my friend Pascal would say, why not just believe in it? The new Pascal's wager is, hey, it's so inexpensive This is the responsible and humble thing to do. And 
Who's going to bring me back? My family? Some institution that I care about? My avatar? Any of those are possible, but to me, this is the most interesting one. I don't know if I should come back. I'm going to leave it to the future to decide if they want to reboot my simulation and talk to me. Maybe my kids will. Maybe everybody will. I don't know. It's the most conservative thing to do. This is my favorite motivation. I believe once you have 100,000 people that have done this in any country or have seriously considered doing it, I believe these are the kind of social benefits you start to get now, regardless of whether anything comes back in the future. What kind of benefits do you get? A much more science-oriented populace, a progress-oriented populace. They believe in the concept of progress. Today, do we spend a lot of money on science as a society? No. If you wanted to shift it, this to me is one of the most single most powerful ways to do it. Get people bought into this idea that the social contract is maybe different than what you thought. More future-oriented society, more preservation-oriented, more sustainability. I'm not going to piss on the world today because I might be back. Truth and justice. I'm not going to lie and do bad things today because you know what? That's going to come out. Other people's brains have recorded that. Talk about crime fighting in the future, the value of this. We haven't even considered it, have we? And more community oriented. Like I said, the social contract changes. The best book of the last 10 years is called Better Angels of Our Nature. It's 800 pages. Big book. Subtitle is Why Violence Has Declined. You want to understand why violence has gone off a cliff statistically over the last thousand years and how it's going, how we're becoming less violent today, massively less violent. Inner city violence went off a cliff in the 90s. You look at all of these kinds of violence trends and you say, well, why is that? Pinker's fundamental idea is, well, the social contract keeps getting better. So human life gets more valuable and people are less willing to do bad things. Here's another five order of magnitude social relevance thing that you should know about. In the Netherlands, it's been legal to do assisted suicide since 2002. And a physician board needs to consent, usually less than six months of life expectancy. Now, 7% of all Netherlanders die in palliative care under sedation like uh, morphine. But did you know that 2.3% of all Netherlanders every year choose euthanasia? And when you have 100,000 members of a society, you can have a mobile euthanasia clinic if you want. And that's what they just got a few months ago. So this doesn't have to happen in a hospice or a home anymore in Netherlands, or a hospice or a hospital. Now, since May in Netherlands, you can have a euthanasia clinic come out to your house. Do you think that 2.3% is going to go up? I do. This is something, this is a choice, a freedom that they want. So I want to leave you with the idea about what the freedom of brain preservation could do for us. Okay? Once we have 100,000 people behind it in any country. So what are the next steps? You can read our website and look at our newsletter. You can share them with friends and family. You can join one of our social networks. You can donate to our nonprofit. We currently are getting $100 a week in donations, $5 or more, price of a cup of coffee. And we need another 10000 to evaluate this mouse brain. We've already got 15000 so we're very close. You can volunteer on any project that we have. We have several going. We meet every fortnight. You can respect other people's end-of-life choices. And you can also demand for yourself a legal, accessible, and affordable brain preservation choice. Because it looks like the science is very close to being proven. You can help your friends with both their biological and their digital cells. Most people don't understand they have this digital cyber twin that's emerging. You can help them with that, help them use it well. And you can be happy because we live in an amazing time. We're incredibly lucky to be alive right here and now. And I think the future is ours if we want it. Thank you.